Well, hello, everybody. It's your Hollywood folklore pal, Angela Arden. And here we are today with a brand new vlog. Okay, I have to tell you a little pre preface uh, before uh, we continue too much further. Of course, you've seen the title. That's probably why you clicked on it. And you saw the opening picture. But what you might not know is that I waited two years. I didn't wouldn't see this movie for two years until it was the night before the Academy Awards. The night before the big story involving Will Smith and Chris Rock at the Academy Awards. Also, Questlove won his Oscar for Summer of Soul. So, but this night before, on one of my cable channels, was showing um, only uh, award-winning, uh, Oscar award-winning movies for the entire evening. Um, and one of them was Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. And there it was, and all I had to do was click on it. I love Quentin Tarantino. I love Leo DiCaprio. I love Brad Pitt. And I didn't know it at the time, but I would certainly come to love Margot Robbie. As the entire world has known for the last two years, just what a sensational movie, um, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, really is, I didn't watch it. It's so unlike me. But let me quickly, briefly tell you why. I was a kid. There was a Time magazine and a Life magazine uh, subscription that my parents received. Time, I believe, was weekly. It was a weekly periodical, and Life was monthly. And on the cover of Life was Vietnam, and on the cover of Time was they were covering the Manson murders. The problem with a really good movie is that no one wants to tell you the end because they don't want to ruin it for you. So, for two years, I should have realized because of Inglorious Bastards and other movies of Quentin Tarantino's that I just wouldn't, I didn't want to know anything about it. I know I stopped in the middle of a paragraph and started another one. Sometimes I do that when a new thought comes to me, even though while I'm explaining the past one. And really, the bottom line is that regardless of all of the information that was on there on how Tarantino, without giving this away to you, even after two, two years, um, you know, you may not have seen it. So let me just say, say that Quentin Tarantino, in his way, artfully and magically dances with the story until he has something that is clearly made with an intent of love and joy and respect. The thing I love about Quentin Tarantino is that he remembers that making films is an art, and that means even when you are dealing with a historical story, you are using paints that happen to be cameras and the color that we see through them. You are using a canvas, which happens to be actors, locations, and script. And he speaks to the most intelligent person in that theater each and every time and he understands that we all have a wishful imagination. So, without giving anything away, understand that that is my takeaway from this movie that I am sure I will see at least, what, 30 to 100 more times before my life is over on this earth. And then I'll probably watch it in heaven. It's that kind of a movie. Okay, so I really do believe I had a lot to say, and I do believe that I said it in as brief a verbal space as possible. 
I'm trying to get better at this as far as that goes, and I think I am. So now, without any further ado, clearly the star of this vlog is Once Upon a Time, and the article is from Esquire Magazine, uh, May 21st of 2019. It is an interview by Michael Haney and photographs by Alexei Lubomirsky. Michael Haney interviews Quentin Tarantino, Brad Pitt, and Leonardo DiCaprio in this interview. And it is called, the title of the interview is called Quentin Tarantino. Brad Pitt and Leonardo DiCaprio take you inside Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. And the subtitle reads, As the director unveils his highly anticipated ninth film, Esquire sits him down with his headlining stars for a provocative three-way question and answer about Hollywood past and present. But what's Charles Manson and River Phoenix got to do with it? Now, I want you to know that having given you, this is my first aside, I want you to know that having given you the uh, date, the periodical's title, and uh, the, um, <clears throat> the, the uh, name of the journalist, as well as the photographer, uh, you can go and look this up. Um, it's going to be as complete as I can make it. However, my vlog is, um, it is a family vlog. So if there are things in it that are a little too blue, uh, that I, I saw some things. So, uh, if there are some that are too blue, I will simply skip over that. I will tell you, um, blue portion, um, and how many questions or paragraphs it was, so that you know where, if you want to go back and uh, find this on the internet and you want to see that, you know where uh, to look on the um, article. Also, this is an endeavor, this article is lengthy, and so it is going to be in parts. And here we go. Quentin Tarantino is in my face. He's smiling, polite, but still in my face nose to nose like listen he says I've come up with a few questions that could be really good for you to ask his voice is hushed conspiratorial but since it's Tarantino it's also stage whisper loud and naturally the words tumble out of his mouth with an urgency I would in any other encounter Describe as Tarantino-esque. We're on the patio of a house in Hollywood Hills. A minute earlier, I was alone under the eaves, looking at Tarantino, Brad Pitt, and Leonardo DiCaprio, standing near the pool, all of Los Angeles unspooling into the horizon behind them. For a moment, I found myself staring at the three of them, thinking, well, damn don't exactly see this every day. I'm waiting for them to finish being photographed so that we can talk about how they came together to make Tarantino's new movie, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, and what they learned through that creative process. Today will be the first time all three of them have been in the same room since they wrapped production in November. For the past six months, Tarantino has been racing to finish cutting the film to prepare it at Cannes. Still, he found time to phone me two days ago and give me some backstory on the film's development. Yet it seems since then, he's also had time to think about what we could discuss. It occurs to me that Tarantino is, in fact directing me on how he wants me to deliver my questions, my lines. When we spoke on the phone, Tarantino told me, this film is the closest thing I've done to Pulp Fiction, end quote. 
What that means in tone and feel, I can't reveal. But what that means in terms of structure is this. Think multiple characters, parenthesis, some real, some imagined, and parenthesis, and storylines that are seemingly unrelated until they are not. Until they intersect and intertwine in surprising ways. This film, Tarantino says, is also, quote, probably my most personal. I think of it like my memory piece. Alfonso, in box parenthesis, it says his last name, which is, uh, I'm going to try and pronounce it, Kua Ron. And it is spelled C-U-A-R-O-N with an one of those accents over the O. Uh, end box parenthesis. Had Roma and Mexico City, 1970. I had L.A. and 1969. This is me. This is the year that formed me. I was six years old then. This is my world, and this is my love letter to L.A. The story, in short, and without giving away too much, goes like this. It's 1969, a year of tremendous upheaval, not just in America's streets, but also on the back lots of Hollywood. The Golden Age is ending. The original studio system, which has been a source of stability and structure for 50 years, is collapsing as the under 30 counterculture rejects traditional plot lines and traditional leading men. It's the year Easy Rider and Midnight Cowboy and The Wild Bunch break big. Films that celebrate the anti-hero and upend the definition of what a matinee idol looks like. It's against this background that we meet Rick Dalton, parenthesis, DiCaprio, and parenthesis, comma, a declining star and a veteran of TV westerns. Rick has, through a combination of ego and dumb decisions, blown his chance to cross over into movie stardom, like Steve McQueen, parenthesis, Damian Lewis, and parenthesis, period. About the only thing he can count on is the friendship of a longtime stunt double, Cliff Brook, parenthesis, Pitt, and parenthesis, period. Parenthesis, meanwhile, Rick's agent, played by Al Pacino, is trying to get him to do a spaghetti western, period, and parenthesis. Then, one night, Rick realizes he might just be one pool party away from turning his career around. His new neighbors, it turns out, are the golden girl of the moment, Sharon Tate, parenthesis, Margot Robbie, and parenthesis, comma, and her husband, Roman Polanski. Parenthesis, Raphael Zewirusha, and parenthesis, comma, who is, thanks to Rosemary's Baby, the hottest director in town. The stories of Rick, Cliff, and Tate unfold over three days, or, as Tarantino says, in three acts. Colon Mark, February 8th, February 9th, and Finally, August 8th, the night when Charles Manson, parenthesis, Damon Harriman, and parenthesis, dispatched four members of his, quote, family, end quote, to the house next to Rick's on Silo Drive in Beverly Hills. There are 12 words that I'm leaving out in the details of that evening. Because they upset me to read, so they might upset some of you to hear. However, I don't want to leave out that the role of hairdresser Jay Sebring was played by Emile Hirsch. 
And there are three more words to add to uh, what I removed in the description of that evening. And now, back to the article. It was the night when, as Joan Didion famously wrote, comma, quote, The sixties ended abruptly. The tension broke. The paranoia was fulfilled. Period. End quote. Once Upon a Time in Hollywood is a film that vibrates with ambition, with the entire cast performing at the height of their talent inside a brilliant story. It's also a film that almost never got made, mostly because Tarantino spent five years writing it as a novel before, quote, I let it become what it wanted to become, comma, end quote, he says, comma, quote, for a long time, I didn't want to accept it. Then I did. Period. End quote. It's late afternoon when Pitt enters the living room and drops down in the center of a semicircle couch. Tarantino has already claimed the right hand side. We're waiting for DiCaprio. Pitt settles in, looks around, and says something that is clearly for a all boys room. That's me, Angela, telling you this last part. However, I, Angela, am not a boy, so I will be omitting this very funny and humorous, light-hearted thing that he said. It is there in the internet if you really want to go research that. That's okay. More boy humor involving all three, and DiCaprio enters and sits and we're off. Michael Haney. I don't know if this is a group therapy session or a version of the dating game. So let's jump in. Brad and Leo, what attracted you to these roles? If I understand correctly, you are two of the only people who have read the entire script. Brad Pitt, which in order to read, I had to go to Quentin's house and sit on his patio. Leonardo DiCaprio, I sat on the patio too. Quentin Tarantino, there was only one copy? I remember one of you made a comment. Then he quotes the comment. I like this dirty cover page. Period, end quote. Brad Pitt, I went back weeks later and there was like a collection of more stains. The stains had been building on the page. Michael Haney, what pulled you guys into this project? Leo DiCaprio. Well, first off, the chance to work with Mr. Tarantino. And certainly this time period was fascinating. It was this homage to Hollywood. I don't think there's been a Hollywood film like this. And by that I mean a film set in Hollywood and about Hollywood, which gets its nails dirty, gets into the everyday life of an actor and his stunt double. 1969 is a seminal time in cinema history as well as in the world. Rick and Cliff, they're part of the old guard in Hollywood. But they're also trying to navigate in this new world of the hippie revolution and free love. I love the idea of taking on this struggling actor who is trying to find his footing in this new world and his pal who he's been with through all these wars in Hollywood. Quentin so brilliantly captures what's going on in the changing of America, but also through these characters' eyes, how Hollywood was changing. It was captivating when I first read it. The characters had the imprint of Quentin's immense knowledge of cinema history. You are in awe of the detail, and you know it's fucking authentic. He laughs. Brad Pitt, 
It's layers deep, beyond any of my understanding. Even the title, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, is an homage, and it's connected. Michael Haney, Quentin, what are you saying with this title? On one hand, it evokes a fairy tale. On the other hand, it echoes a Sergio Leone western or a gangster movie. Quentin Tarantino. Well, there is a fairy tale aspect, so the title fits pretty good. But this is a memory piece also, so it's not historical fact per se. It is a Hollywood of reality, but a Hollywood of the mind at the same time. I was so happy with the title, but I was afraid to put it into the atmosphere. Whenever I refer to this project, I refer to it as Magnum Opus. A movie came out two years ago called Once Upon a Time in Venice. I go, that was scary. Brad Pitt, Once Upon a Time in Burbank, he laughs. Brad, what attracted you to this script? Michael Haney asks. Brad Pitt. Certainly the period is great fun. Quentin Tarantino is the last purveyor of cool. If you land in one of his films, you know you're in great hands. Quentin gives you these speeches, the kind that you wished you'd had said on the drive home, that you think of a day later. I felt the script was an evolution of Quentin's voice. I mean, we know Quentin Tarantino as an auteur sending film in singular original direction. But I found this an evolution and an amalgamation of what we loved about his other eight films. Quentin Tarantino I didn't try to do that, but it just started happening. Brad Pitt. And it felt really good-hearted. Like warm-hearted. Leo DiCaprio. That is very true. Brad Pitt. And doing this with Leo was really cool and a rare opportunity. Then there was just the whole thing, where we all grew up with the lore of the lead actor and his stuntman. That relationship and craft, I mean, there are epic stories of these duos. Burt Reynolds had Hal Needham. Steve McQueen had Bud Ekins. Kurt Russell had his guy. Harrison Ford had his. These guys were partners for decades, and it's something that is not the same in our generation as the pieces became more movable. Leo DiCaprio, it's also this authentic Hollywood story in the sense that our characters are the voyeurs of the majesty and glamour of Hollywood. We're the outsiders. We're the guys who are there day to day trying to get the work. Brad and I are watching Hollywood change, but we're in the grind. And we have this connected relationship where we have each other's backs through thick and thin. That's the perspective Quentin took. And it seems like these characters could truly exist. And then this Manson stuff is happening around us. The Polanski-Tate story. Michael Haney. Brad, how was working with Quentin on this different from working with him on Inglorious Bastards? Brad Pitt. It felt like walking right back in. I have an immediate comfort on Quentin's sets. It's the atmosphere. It's the conversations we have, which are just fun. You know, 
We all kind of came of age in this industry about the same time. Leo DiCaprio. We're all 90s babies. Brad Pitt. We all speak the same language and understand the same seismic events or minor events in our community. Squarebox Parent turns to DiCaprio and Squarebox Parent. One of my first jobs was guest starring on your show. Leo DiCaprio, growing pains? Brad Pitt, when you were just starting. Michael Haney, it's astounding to think you all hit at the same time. Quentin, you have Reservoir Dogs in 92 and then Pulp Fiction in 94. Brad, you have Thelma and Louise, A River Runs Through It, and Interview with the Vampire in 91, 92, and 94. And Leo, you do What's Eating Gilbert Grape in 93. All three of you have been on top in Hollywood for a quarter century now. Quentin Tarantino, Brad's even in True Romance in 1993. The first script I ever wrote. And he almost steals the show in the third act. They all laugh. Leo DiCaprio. Don't fucking condescend me, man! Square box parent. DiCaprio turns to Pitt and smiles. Period and box parent. I love that line. Brad Pitt. There is an immediate comfort stepping into Quentin's dialogue. It's why actors want to work with him. You should have seen the line of people trying to get into this film, offering their services just to be a part of this thing, even just for a day. Michael Haney. Quentin, anyone I talk to tells me how joyful your sets are. How if you call for another take, you'll say, Let's do it one more time. Why? And then the entire crew yells, Quentin Tarantino, Brad Pitt, and Leo DiCaprio chime in all together here and say, quote, Because we love making movies! End quote. Brad Pitt. It's that great spirit. True. There is a, a video on YouTube which uh, shows Quentin Tarantino actually saying that to his team and his team responding in just exactly that way. I tried to imitate the whole thing from my memory as accurately as I could for you. If I knew which uh, video it was, I would direct you to it. Hopefully you'll stumble upon it. There's a lot of great YouTube um, videos and vlogs on um, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. And I hope you can find as many as you can and uh, check them out because they're all so interesting. And uh, because this is such a special and rare film, there is so much to learn. For instance, there is a uh, vlogger named, his uh, page is named Days with Jordan the Lion. And you're on YouTube and you go to his vlog of three years ago called Behind the Scenes While Filming Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. What he did, he lives in Hollywood, was he heard that um, Quentin Tarantino was filming a Once Upon a Time in Hollywood and he was doing the Hollywood Boulevard um, scene. And uh, if you stayed on the sidewalk, you could walk back and forth and see them filming. And not only does he um, catch them filming... But he shows us the detail. I mean, he walks along the sidewalks and shows us how Tarantino... And his um, his prop team and his art team put so much uh, detail into this boulevard, into making it look like it did in 1969, the Summer of Love. Right down to the 
tie-dyed t-shirts and the concert and political posters of the day. And the artwork is screaming. It's just beyond. Psychedelic mod, hip and cool. Jordan also has uh, a few other uh, vlogs out around that time uh, of the locations of uh, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. He kind of fought his ground a little bit uh, on Hollywood Boulevard. Uh, Quentin Tarantino had uh, his guys uh, saying, keep moving, keep moving. And uh, let me just say, I am sure that if uh, Quentin Tarantino were a 20-something-year-old vlogger today, especially, or really of any age, that's kind of the newest filming um media medium out there right now and so like uh, all mediums when they're new they don't get as much respect that's sort of something that is earned and so if you ever vlog you'll find that sometimes you really have to fight for your right to you know to get in there and and get your footage and get things that are really wor the worthwhile stuff is always the stuff that's off limits or super protected you know but um, sometimes as in with uh, Quentin Tarantino's set uh, they were pretty understanding and they remained polite they weren't you know um, mean or rude or anything in fact I just fell in love with the whole process of making movies even more because of that video getting to see uh, Quentin Tarantino and his team uh, at work and that passion just really coming to fruition. Well, we have come to the end of episode one of this very first ever interview with with Quentin Tarantino, Leo DiCaprio, and Brad Pitt. Through Esquire Magazine's journalist, Michael Haney. And all photographs here are the exclusive photographs that were used uh, in the um, magazine and accompanied of, of this interview and accompanied the interview. We've only seen less than half of them. The rest are to come and they are by Esquire's photographer on this project, Alexi Lubomirsky. So I hope you have enjoyed this uh, trek with me so far. I'll see you for part two. Until then, you go out and be the star of your own life. This is Angela Arden saying bye for now. If you liked this video and you'd like to see more, and this is so important to a vlogger's survival, please one, subscribe, two like and three hit that bell also if you'd like to help hollywood folklore's goal of road tripping to great story destinations in hollywood just click on my patreon address below which is just www.patreon.com slash hollywood star and that will put you smack dab in the middle of hollywood folklore Thank you for the love and right back at you.